great to be back again and welcome to our eighth show. Today I'm really, really excited with who we have speaking and it is our very own Akua Bayanu. So Akua, how are you today my lovely? I'm good, yes. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to enjoy being not the, I think of myself as the weather girl for your shows actually. So uh, yeah, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, it's really, really good to um, have you with us today, Akua. So, Akua, could you um, let my audience know how you've got into activism, please? How I got into activism? Wow, I can't actually remember a time of not being in activism. I, I come out of a, a, a socialist household, a single mum, who stood as a local councillor, I think I was eight, shoving leaflets through the door um, at 12. She'd encourage me and my brother and sister, we wanted a youth club to go set one up, which we did. I went to art school uh, and immediately became secretary of the Students' Union. It, it was sort of like, I was raised to serve, let's put it that way, <laughs> and have been an activist ever since. And, hap and, and I suppose happily, I can't imagine, um, I can't imagine how, where you find a place in the world where you don't want to actually step up and, and make a difference. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I got, especially now, I, I have no patience with what I call the sort of armchair armchair socialists who just spend a lot of time reading newspapers and moaning about what's going on and I ask them what they're doing about it. Hmm. So, yeah. yeah. So, Akuba, what actions have you been currently working on, my love? Yeah, where to start, really? Um, so, generally, obviously, I am one of the spokespeople for Labour Black Socialists' campaign for an actively anti-racist Labour Party. And that's huge. That's a huge piece of work uh, from, from, from my perspective. It's, I have a lot of commitment to that work. Um, so there's a lot of talking about it and trying to get people to understand the big picture, uh, the local picture and the personal picture within that. So there's a range of things. But I'm also uh, I'm campaigning to be on the National Women's Committee. And that has seen me also looking a lot at the issues around women. So uh, there's issues around for people from black communities. And, you know, as you know, I'm very addicted to black and our UK history of black and the unity between African heritage and South Asian communities, which mm -hmm. is rooted in our activism, our experience. And so I hang on to the term black. I mean, growing up for me, that actually included the Irish. And sometimes I, I want to go and have that conversation with my Irish comrades about that. Um, but with the National Women's Committee, I'm always obviously a woman and I'm really, really interested in and working hard on a range of issues around for women, for members in the party, but also for women generally. Obviously, it's been a, a roller coaster couple of weeks um, from International Women's Day, sort of bookended with International Women's Day and Mother's Day. And then, you know, the awful scenes that we saw uh, in, in, in London and Clapham Common and more recently in Bristol um, around the, the, what happened with, with Sarah Everard, but then also which then coupled and really interweaves with the, with the new, what do we call it, criminalization, crime, police crime, courts and sentencing bill. And mm. basically watching the free, freedoms of this country just disappearing uh, under the cover of COVID, under the cover of new regulations and new police powers in order to pr protect us. And um, so that's been a, a huge bit of work, but looking at a whole range of issues around the domestic violence, around how women, why women have carried such a burden um, mm -hmm. in terms of COVID, uh, you know, both in terms of the workplace, but at home, carers, children at home, you know, not in school, um, yeah, it's 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 been a, a very very busy time, and I'm really working a lot around looking at those issues and how best to represent those issues for members in the party, and also to raise women's voice in the party. And I think um, I've seen socialist women being a really uh, strong voice for change within the Labour Party, and then obviously when we get power for the country as a whole. Thanks, Akuba. So you talk about, um, you know, running for the Women's Committee. What else will you be running for this year? <laughs> um, yeah, Some, uh, somebody made a little sly comment because um, obviously I just got onto the Central Council of Socialist Health Association and 
uh, 12 months after selection, it will be in May, I'm on, I will be on the ballot for um, Hume, the, it's one of the uh, Manchester Central Wards. Uh, Hume, I live in Moss Side. Hume is, is literally, Moss Side and Hume have had a long history of shared activism, of, of shared culture. Um, and so that campaign is really gearing up and it's it's going to be really interesting. So for me, shielding, I've been advised that I can stop shielding to the level I have been on the 1st of April. Mm. And we try not to think that that's some sort of weird joke because it's been April Fool's Day, but I can't wait to get back out. So I've been, my campaigning has been very online, very, you know, I, I've um, done a whole series of, sort of community-based Zoom events, um, and a lot of online, a lot of di this thing called dialogue. Yeah. We ring up loads of households and listen to the engaged tone and then ring another one. Um, but yeah, cam campaigning in Hume is really picking up. So I'm, yeah. I'm spending my time at the moment really looking at a range of issues that residents have brought to mm -hmm. my attention, to the attention of the other two sitting councillors. Um, so just to, to, to clarify that, there are actually three sitting councillors, but one was deselected so that I, I was selected in his place. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so Akuwa, tell us the issues that are ha currently happening in Hume. Whoa, so I think it's important to understand geographically where Hume sits. So it, yeah. it, it, it abuts the city centre, so the centre of Manchester. Uh, and this is a city that really hasn't, well, up until this last year, 2020, hasn't, I think, suffered in the same way in terms of economically. It's been through a real period of economic growth to a certain extent, to certain factors within the city. Not all communities have benefited, as we know happens in these things. But um, so it's a city centre that's seeing investment. You know, we've had uh, the BBC relocate to Manchester. No, that's not the city centre. In terms mm. of where people are living, there's a lot of building, a lot of, um, what do they call it? luxury high-end accommodation being oh. built in the city centre so those areas like Hume like Moss Side like Ardwick which are the first set of wards abutting the city central ones are okay. really at risk in many ways from their communities not being valued for the sort of the culture and the, the, the value they have in terms of the people who live there but actually seen as a sort of the next resource in that sort of encroaching city centre push to see where else they can build high-end accommodation and make more money for, for the coffers. Um, so there's quite a, there's a lot of pressure there from those areas, especially because then they're, they're, they're historically areas of working class impoverished communities that have been through various processes of redevelopment or not. So Hume is, is quite, there'll be areas in Hume that have had uh, a rolling program, it seems, of redevelopment. Um, hmm. So, you know, we, we, we saw what were the, the, the old back-to-back -back terrace houses pulled down in the 70s and a whole bunch of buildings put up and then they were all pulled down in the 90s and new ones are going up. Um, but not always with the consideration of the welfare of the community, but as in how much money it makes for developers and how much money that then makes for the, city, the central coffers. So there's a lot of need to try and get the city to think more holistically around mm. Hume, to actually consider what the area is, who the, who the people are there, and what makes it special, what makes it unique, and what, what we should be investing in, in terms of the, the people and the infrastructure in Hume for the people who currently live in Hume. Yeah. Um, so there are certain areas that where there is a real um, sort of striking difference between Say there's an area called Britannia Basin, which backs up straight to another area called St. George's. And there's a real divide in terms of sort of home owning flat, flat, beautiful, brand new flats and social housing that has had a, you know, because the whole social housing um, area has had uh, underfunding. So there's sort of areas of neglect. There are issues around parking in those areas. So a lot of the, as the developments happened, a lot of the workforce go and park across the way, so, so blocking it, making it really difficult for the residents of St George's. Um, and there's been a parking scheme that I think is, must be reaching its third, fourth year of waiting for it to come in. And so it, there is that, that thing of joining existing campaigns where residents are actually completely fed up, they're distrustful, 
They don't know whether their elected representative is going to make a difference or even cares. Um, so we've got to try and really convince people that you know, we're on side and we're listening and I'm listening and I'm there. Um, but at the same time, this is areas of people that, where people are really passionate about their area and to be able to tap into that and support them as well. So mm. there's the whole issue around the so parking and development. Development's massive. There's, there's, there's a suggestion that they're trying to centralise student accommodation. So we've got, well, I suppose now two, three. The universities keep expanding and then contracting again. So like there was the Institute of Science and Technology, which I think has gone back into uh, either the University of Manchester or Manchester Metropolitan, and the Salford University, which isn't very far away. And um, obviously the students are all sort of living across and around each other because Salford, uh, again, abuts the city centre, like the centre, Salford comes right up to Manchester city centre. There's, there's not a big distance between the two. Um, so there is a sort of there's a pressure on Hume to take more and more student accommodation, more and more blocks, and without and without there, there seeming to be an assessment of what the pandemic has had, you know, what's the impact of the pandemic on the student population? We've obviously, I don't know if you'll be aware, there's been some real issues where students were locked into their accommodation. Yeah, there was a massive outbreak of COVID. You know, where, but where students were actually called back to go come to go back to university, but actually classes weren't open. So mm. that there was like the money making side of universities was at conflict, I think, with the education side of universities. And but the impact on that in terms of the communities where those students live and their relationship with the wider with the wider residence groups um, around noise, around feelings of safety, and also just unhappiness that those students, you know, they are also. Um, Many of them will be registered to vote, so they're also my constituents, and feeling feeling that they have been ripped off with their being charged full fees for the university, mm -hmm. being being um, charged to for their accommodation, even though there's no reason for them to be in there. There's lots of issues around that, and then looking at how that works with the with the wider population as well. So there are, I, I think if you're going to be a counsellor in Hume, you have to get really quickly to grips with planning law, legislation and the systems that work, because it's not that straightforward. You can't just um, object to a planning in, uh, application. There has to be some really clear reasons and if, you, and if you're there to support your residents, they need to be organised. And mm. for very fortunately we have such a strong history of, of activists of resident activists so mm. currently like so tomorrow i'm going to be meeting on zoom with a group who are their campaigns called block the block and they are looking actively at stopping the redevelopment of a uh, how many story nine story 250 student accommodation which mm. will completely block their light it will block the light to their garden area it's, it will be coming on keep last few remaining areas of open space. There's also uh, around housing, there's quite a lot of housing issues in Hume. There's been some issues around cladding, um, around different legislation in terms of where people have bought their their accommodation, uh, only to find that, that cladding is an issue and then being expected to find more funding to put that put that right. And you know the developers, the people who built it aren't in sight and the government are saying they won't give support to sort of chase those down. So that's another group called the Cladiators, I think, um, who I had some contact with and I want to, in to increase that as I get busier uh, in, the, in the ward just to support that. Because some of that, if we're talking about people's lives being at risk. You know, we've got a member um, who has is a wheelchair, wheelchair user. So, you know, like any issues around how you know around developing that block and how she can safely evacuate if there are any problems and it's it's a really massive and and, and contentious area and there are there are some central government issues that we can't address as local councillors mm. but you can still support your residents who are wanting to address them and you know me i like to be interested in what how the national picture yeah. is affecting on the local picture um, yeah, so Bikubo, in terms of um, ethnic minorities in Hume, is there much of an engagement, would you say, with local politics and ethnic minorities? That's interesting. I, 
if I would, I, I have, I haven't experienced that myself directly, but I think there's work that can be done. Uh-huh. Um, so in terms of a, a representative level, um, so there is another uh, woman counsellor, Leanne Ifbon, and the net writer, the two other women. Uh, Leanne also comes from an African heritage background. Um, I wouldn't say that she necessarily appears to be embedded in an African in an African sort of heritage community necessarily. And I would like to do more of that work. And, cer- and also certainly if we go in to see the membership, you know, into the branch, it is not as culturally diverse as the area that it represents. So there is still work to be done at a branch level. And I know there's a lot of willingness and work being done by branch members to think about how they can do that. And I'm hoping to be part of, and I think that's partly really why they also fought so hard to to have me shortlisted and then selected was because they want to address those issues. They want to become a much more inclusive branch and I want to work with them. Um, I mean, the area, I don't have the stats in terms of what the area is. I know because I used to work in this area a lot as an artist activist. Mm -hmm. And at one point it had the largest Chinese community in the city where where residents in view. Um, And I'd be really interested to see if that's still the case because I'm talking probably eight to ten years ago uh, in terms of that particular statistic. Um, And there is uh, a quite a long term established African heritage um, mixed African heritage community in you and in Moss Side that sort of spills over you wouldn't be able to see a boundary between between the two and a sort of growing a growing Somali community so that's mostly big in Moss Side but it's, it's appearing more and more in you and a smaller South Asian community as well and then lots of other communities dotted about. Yeah, so yeah, that's good to hear. It's interesting to hear. I think it's pretty much um, basically everywhere, isn't it, in terms of um, ethnic mi- minority participation within local branches. So yeah, I just wanted to find out like what what it's like round your way because it's pretty much like that um, in where I am in Putney. So um, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. So Akua, in terms of you being a councillor. What do you feel that um, you can offer your residents? What is on your your leaflets, my friend? What are you promoting and what are you fighting for? Are we going for a Green New Deal? Are we um, focusing on equalities? What is your focus, my friend? Right. So my focus within Hume, I think, I think there are four main strands, I suppose, in terms of what I think are really important. So education, we have a number of schools, um, predominantly primary school, but we also have a large secondary school. Um, and I am really interested in education for our young people and ensuring that the children and families in Hume get the best education they can get. So supporting those schools. Um, and for some of those, those, there are some real issues. So there is a school. So Hume is, is um, because of where it's located, it also has some of the main roads leading, particularly from the south, into the city. So we have a, a, a road that's called Princess Parkway that comes up and it's, it, if you came up from London, you came up the M1 onto the M6 and then you transferred over, you would come up this road. And there's a primary school that's right on the road. And I know that they were trying to get funding to, for instance, build a hedge that's supposed to be really good at blocking the pol- pol- pollutants that come from heavy traffic. You know, because you have children playing out there and then you've got just, cars and cars pumping their poisonous gases so though that's a real issue and I know that they weren't able to so I keep checking out and see how the school is doing and that hedge isn't there and I'd really like to sort of support and help them with that so education but also lifelong education you know I'm old enough to have experienced really well the sort of adult education and Hume had a really good adult education building um, I remember years ago working with one of the primary schools and taking the children over there to make clay tiles for a mosaic they were doing. They had a kiln and that, you know, obviously they would have had loads of other things apart from the arts, but I had a very particular interest. So education is really key to what, supporting what's already there and helping those schools get greater investment into the area for those children. I'm also really interested in mental health. There's, a, there's an ongoing issue across the city around mental health provision, but there is some really passionate activists who are based in Hume um 
who are they they're a, a group of families and people who've experienced the um the mental health service uh, in different loads of different ways whether people have been sectioned or not or what the treatment they've had so this is friends and families organization about how they can battle for the rights but they're also partly at the moment about trying to have a conversation around generally how mental health provision in the city there's very little you know the, the emergency mental health provision it's literally right down to you present yourself at a and e if you're in a crisis with mental health and i was speaking to someone recently and they waited for an inconsiderable length of time it was hours maybe six hours only to hold the person they were waiting to see was no longer available and that's when you're at a point of crisis within mental health there are other crises but that is the sort of main point but within hume in particular there are activists and they're interested in there's a group called charm and what they're interested in is looking at quality the quality of mental health provision so that we've just got some money a large amount of money for investment in infrastructure in a new hospital uh, and that's going to be placed in north in north manchester but the issue for this group and it's there are a wide group of patients of family patients and of uh, practitioners of, of, of staff people who work in the mental health service uh, this as well are saying that the model that they're using is the one that needs to be addressed it needs to be much more person-centered um and not be you know it's, it's all very well building a brand new hospital where everyone gets, gets an ensuite bedroom if actually the provision of their care remains the old model so it's it's interesting and i really want to support that initiative um green spaces is 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 the other um so some of the earliest work i ever did in hume was working on hume park which was the first new park in manchester for 50 years um and i helped work with local people to produce artwork for the park. Um, so there's Hume Park, but there are other spaces as well. And there's a lot of neglect around those spaces. I think they are to support local people. I was in um, St. George's and I was speaking to a local resident and there was just an area and I could see some investment that happened. And he was saying, yes, they managed to get some money off the electricity board. And then they were working with, I think one Manchester, I think was their housing provider. And they managed to plant these beds, but they, there was a sort of electricity box in the middle of it that's just sort of bare, bricks and a bit ropey and I'm thinking there's a lot of artists as well arts and arts education in, in Hume It'd be great to bring them together and maybe actually start to work more on being more public art to make the area feel more owned by its local people and those people have an investment and a right to make where they live as beautiful and as vibrant as possible so that is the one two three are my main areas and then it's just supporting residents they've got the usual issues around bins around roads around parking um yeah sort of where thank you Akuma. like it it's really really exciting to hear um what you'll be focusing on so in terms of um you know moving forward and if you do get selected and stuff what would be the first thing you'll be working on so i'm selected if i get elected yeah, if you get elected, yeah. Ah, what will be the first thing that I'm working on? That's going to be it. That will be interesting, actually, to see. Um, because it's a really odd process. So I should have been on the ballot paper last last year. So I've had this sort of additional year of being a, a councillor in waiting. And I, I don't do waiting very well um, in terms of like you, you, you want to build relationships quickly and then hit the ground running. So I was I was geared up to do that. I'd been going to surgeries with the counsellors. I'd been really getting to to grips with what the the day to day their day to day practice was, so that I could then make sure that I was an effective add on, not just a duplication of the service that was already there. Um, and this last year has sort of like scuppered that a little. I think I will want to establish the surgeries, back, get them back up and running as quickly as possible. Um, mm. I want to be a case work counsellor someone yeah. who's really available and accessible to to local people um so the surgeries happen in three different locations across Hume. um i've attended i've attended all three locations but actually only entered one of the buildings uh, just in terms of timing so i know where they all are i want to really establish that that will be i guess my, the first thing and then look and talk with the other counsellors so they are already form Quite a formidable team around the planning issues around buildings 
So, uh, and and at the same time, I know like there's a, they also got a level of investment in the park. So there's a Friends of Hume Park. But there are other green spaces. I would, and there are other campaigns about preserving green spaces that I'd mm. really like to bring my expertise and and things like working with that school about getting them a hedge that will filter out you know toxic air from the road. Um, I think I will want to go and visit the schools and and get to know the the other provision. So I've started already. So I've held three what we call Hume Zooms. Hume Zoom. Um, one on mental health, one on arts and education. And my brain has just lost what the other one was on. Oh, yeah. Can't oh, get the staff, yeah. mate. I know, terrible. That's terrible that my brain has just lost that third one. That's completely. Anyway, I did. And they were successful. And we're going to run them again just as an opportunity for people to talk to each other. Mm. And it's interesting that, uh, I mean, like at the first one, I, uh, a, a young couple joined and they'd only moved in like 10 weeks before. And we're just looking oh. to see what they could be involved in. Um, and that's really great to be able to be a conduit for activists and keep that information. Housing. Of course, it would have been about housing. That would have been the third one. Sorry. I'm saying, of course, because I'm going to Manchester Tenants Union and Andrea is another housing person. So <laughs> it was it was around housing um, that I that was that was the third, which is another area of massive passion, particularly protecting uh, not just protecting, but preserving and growing social housing. Mm. Um, it's the physical building of housing, the maintenance and the funding of existing housing, but also the mindset around housing as a right, as a human right, mm. rather than as a financial commodity that people invest in to make them money. It's right, you know, housing should be for people to live in and for everyone to have a chance to live in decent housing, not for somebody to have three or four houses and make loads of money off it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so according to the um, to the stats, after London, Manchester actually has the second highest homeless rates um, in the country. What are your um, what is your thinking about this, ma'am? It's not good, is it? It's not good. And so the we my I rather so for me that is looking at my role not just in terms of being a councillor for my ward, mm. but for being on the council. So mm. in, in Manchester, there are 96 councillors and currently, well, if they were all in place, I think 94 out of those 96 are Labour. So Labour group is, is powerful. We actually organise legislation, you know, like we, what we have control of is controlled by Labour, which doesn't always reflect because as we know, Labour doesn't necessarily mean socialist. So my job will be to be trying to bring that socialist perspective to the council and work with other socialist councillors. So for instance, uh, two years ago, they, the council actually passed a, what's it called, Public Spaces Protection Order, which basically mm -hmm. criminalised homelessness. Oh no. You know, and I would want to work to overturn that and then look at what's the investment that's required to actually support um, people who are experiencing homelessness. Because there's a whole raft of other services that need to be looked at. It's not just about you know sort of rough sleepers which do need to be addressed and there needs to be investment uh, and I'm aware of a number of initiatives and I would want to talk to them about what they see the solutions are everything from um, arts companies that work with homelessness you know need exchanges you know I'm not saying that everybody who's homeless has got a drug problem but there are associated issues around drug use um, look at what we've learned from the everybody in campaign you know, what can we what can we sustain around that? Because Greater Manchester, not only I think it's Greater Manchester that has as much uh, uh, rather than Manchester. Yeah. Um, but Manchester has the highest rate of deaths of street homeless in no. the country. And mm. that needs to be addressed. And that is around and needs to be education of everybody around the, the you know, the lives, homeless people's lives actually matter and we need to take care of them. But also the services around that, you know, whether it's from the GP services through to the healthcare, other types of healthcare, you know, community based healthcare, um, clothing, overnight, all that sort of safety, mm. you know, it's around, you know, different issues for women who are homeless, different issues for people from refugee and asylum seeker backgrounds yeah. for black communities, and actually really delve into it and have some sort of, you know, proper working party to address 
we're next after everyone in so that we yeah. can continue to be everyone in so you've brought up um, refugees and, and migrants so in terms of um greater manchester and even here do you have a high intake of um, refugees and migrants in where where i'm from in wandsworth we've got we've um taken in 145 so um yeah do you know the stats that how many I, you've taken or i don't know the recent stats at all yeah. do you mean 145 in the last year or what? um no we've got 145 refugees um that we've taken in so yeah okay um I, don't, I mean, obviously, from a Greater Manchester wide basis, it's going to be much higher than that. I yeah. know that there have been issues because historically, I've done work around issues around in, in around communities, um, embedding those those you know incoming communities in them and learning from past lessons about how to do that well. Um, so what was happening, and I and I would have to get back up to speed. But when I was more working out in those communities. Um, Often uh, refugees were being settled in areas of high deprivation, and then um, the issues around how those very deprived communities were then encouraged or or supported in and welcoming other people. When you know we're talking about people who are under a load of pressure, so you mm -hmm. get these sort of stories of people. Oh, you know they get the best houses, and then all their kids get bought bikes, and you know, and, you, and you're like, what though? Yeah, there's a lot of education that's needed that wasn't happening or wasn't mm -hmm. happening in a formal way. It was happening, but through other, you know, sort of say that the work I was doing, I was working at a theatre and we were going out and doing work with young people and just addressing those issues through 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 drama, through art making. Um, and that needs to have a much greater level of investment. But I don't know what the current figures are at all, Andrea. Nice one. Thank you, Ikua. So in terms of um, your campaigning, how are you feeling? Are you anxious? Are you scared? Are you ready to rock and roll? Like, So um, Hume has historically been quite a safe Labour seat, and obviously mm -hmm. it's a bit of a safe Labour city. So I, I don't have to have the same level of concerns. I think there were at least Three or four marginal seats we're all called out to go and campaign in, and I will be campaigning for my um, wonderful sister, uh, Marcia Hutchinson, who will be, nice. if, she, if when she gets in, she'll be the first and only African Caribbean councillor. Yeah, she's coming on here soon, isn't it? Is she? Good. Yeah, I'm going to be bringing her on, man. Find yeah. out about that. Um, yeah. So um, I guess I'm just, my, my concerns is being able to, I've got an amazing team supporting me. I have an amazing ward. You know, they fought to have me. Um, they've remained really consistent and patient and on side. So I my my greatest stressor is to be able to match their enthusiasm and their hard work. So what I'm doing at the moment, because I still can't get out, you know, I mean the Labour Party hasn't allowed proper campaigning anyway, but I can't even leaflet. So I've been doing a lot more online stuff. So I've been out on my own taking photographs having distance conversations I can have with one or two people, but I can't like address a great big meeting. I certainly mm. can't be opening loads of doors and shoving shoving flyers through things. Um, which I think is a is a something that we should explore at some point about there's been there well actually for me there's been no acknowledgement from uh, Manchester City Council that I come from a community that's been so ravaged by COVID nineteen. Mm. You know, I lost my direct neighbour in March last year. And it felt like I was still working with people for whom you know, the pandemic was coming and it, and it came and it, it had come for me and for my community. And there's been absolutely no reaching out to check in how, uh, you know, how I'm doing, how anyone, any of the councillors from our backgrounds would be doing. And that I think is really remiss and I will address it. Um, mm. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not anxious. I just want to be able to work harder. So. Yeah. The things that I'm doing, so we, 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 we've all paid around the country for dialogue um, mm. and we get on board and we, I have two sessions a week where I meet people on Zoom and we just support people doing that. You can actually dialogue in your own time and ring up mm. people in the ward. Well, I, but you're not allowed to leave messages at the moment, um, which is a little bit crazy because most of us are just getting answer phones because who answers their landline? It's all landlines. 
you know, we're in the 21st century. I have a landline line. I don't have a phone plugged into it. <laughs> and I imagine a lot of people are the same. So I'm wanting to know, yeah. could we at least agree and agree a statement that we can leave so we can at least leave a message to say mm. that we're called, to say that the Labour Party are interested in how you're doing, you know, what's going on for you and not just come out and vote. You know, I, I want to actually speak to my constituents in a more productive way. So that's one thing, regular dialogue and trying to <clears throat> encourage and be with the team of people. We've been out flyering, getting flyers done, getting the, the right text, the right photo. I'm not as bad as Andrea when it comes to how can I look in that picture? But I am reasonably, <laughs> you know, at my own levels of vanity. Um, being, I, I suppose, making myself, so I'm getting, I'm moving to becoming more and more accessible. So like tomorrow I'm meeting with the campaign for Block the Block. Um, I've been asked to sit and help uh, a local garden centre. They've got some money to develop their cafe. I'll be helping them look at um, who they might bring on board to run that cafe um, to have some experience of how you, do, you know, develop a commercial business that's also responsive to a local community needs. Um, so that's the sort of thing. Um, I've got two more Hume Zooms. One is going to be potentially talking about the launch of a bit of a socialist artist forum. Mm. I quite like to talk about with them and then a more generic one and yeah being able to be much more accessible and hands-on with some of the campaigns that are actually happening so I've been you know while we were through the first lockdown and, and actually beyond I, I was part of a mutual aid group um, and Hume's very rich in terms of activist support so there were three or four uh, mutual aid um, <coughs> around food it was all around food wasn't it mm. people just didn't starve during that process um so i really want to get out and meet those the activists in here because where i was working was actually in alongside and ardwick a different a different area yeah uh, right you know, so you know where need, don't you? yeah <laughs> right so um akuwa what do you feel like um the role of the trade union is within the communities <laughs> I love you, Andrea. Um, let me answer that. What do I think of the role of the trade unions within communities? Hmm. That's quite interesting. I mean, some unions have branches that are geared specifically to being, being community focused, mm. but I don't know if they all are. I happen to be in Unite Community, and I don't want to just plug one union. At this point but i am um and that there is such a crossover in nearly all the activism whether it's around housing homelessness health you know we we we, we support and bring motions from across our activisms um through our unions and i think unions should very much be engaged in supporting the work of their members in their communities um from a work i mean that's a really good question i, I mean i've been thinking about it a lot more in terms of integrating uh, the sort of the membership with our union work, and I hadn't given a, a thought to how I might be engaging unions in our community, except where there is specific. I suppose ex I, the only place where where I thought about that would be, say, with, where there are a large employer that's very specific. So we, you know, we've got a couple of breweries. Um, we have a big um, parcel distribution company. Um, obviously, there there was there is uh, a need to have a conversation with the teachers' unions, with mm -hmm. there being so many schools and uh, and also university students. There's a university campus as well in Hume. Actually, it's got it all. Um, so that would that's an interesting conversation. But that is more about supporting the residents and what their union issues are, rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. But I, you know. You've just given me some really good food for thought. Yeah, I know. I had to like throw in the unions, man. Come on. Yeah. So, um, Akuba, thank you for joining us today. So I'm going to give you now a minute to sell yourself to Hume and tell people in Manchester why they should vote for you and, you know, just tell them how great you are. So over to you, my love. And then we're going to move over to Ridwan. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, I'm really committed to Hume and to the people of Hume. I think it's a wonderful area. 
with so much potential for people to have rich and rewarding lives. Um, I have had a relationship with Hume for many years. My children went to primary school there. My children, who are now 31 and 34, went to primary school there. Um, and I, I suppose I have, a, I have a really ongoing, enduring commitment to the area. I, I feel a synergy with the, with the activism with the, of, of local people. And I think that's the most important thing that I would like to say, is that I'm not coming in to be some great leader from above and you know do loads of things for the people of the poor people of Hume. Not at all. I know that's not my area. That Hume is a a bubbling place of activism and I want to just be there to make sure that the, as a local councillor I support that as much as possible through the you know the through the actions of the council, <clears throat> but also bringing my general expertise or experience, not expertise, my experience as a as a campaigner to work side by side, shoulder to shoulder with the people of you. Thank you, my lovely. It's always a pleasure um, seeing you and having you on Akuwa. You will be back next week as the Weber girl. Thank you. But we had to find out what you're, you're up to locally and obviously push your campaign forward. So I'm wishing you all the best. You're going to smash it. I hope you get elected. And if you don't, there will be problems. So be other than now, Thank you yeah, very there much, will Andrea. be problems. <laughs> So now we are going to go over to my brother from another mother, Ridawan, who is going to update us on the Labour ca um, campaign strike and everything else, um, Black Socialists. Because it is critical that people join trade unions because trade unions have done significant amounts of work to stabilise our communities because one of the first things that they've done from the PCS uh, union, that parents have maximum working hours. So they have time to spend with their loved ones. People in work have paid annual leave so they can afford to take leave. It is not for the elites alone and that is for the well-being of the workers as well as their families. By forcing employers to abide by contracts, it ensures that people in work don't necessarily work themselves to death and have time for their families and their communities. Paid parental leave so that when people do take leave associated with the important social task of being a parent, that is paid for. Tackling discrimination at work and in the community, ensuring that people, when they do work, there is a minimum wage so that there is not slave wages, despite the fact that we have people who are seriously committed to take um, us to the very bottom so that, and we are there, zero hours contracts, no commitments to people in, in basic conditions of employment. People are, are fired and rehired on worse conditions. And that is why one needs trade unions. And it is the fight that trade unions uh, uh, um, fight at the workplace transforms the way we function in our community. So despite the problems with trade unions, don't believe the propaganda from the government the, the Tories hate trade unions. And there are people in the Labour Party who hate trade unions. Let's not, let's not beat about the bush here. It is a fight to be a trade unionist in the Labour Party, but it is a bigger fight for trade unionism because with the Tory government, because as far as the Tories are concerned, trade unions are a pain in the neck. So what is the update on the campaign? We are all over the place because the issues are bubbling all over the place. In fact, we need more people to help us because the, the, the issue, labor black socialists actually need, because of the scale of the problems, full-time officers who can attend to the issue, because just look at our sister Equa and look at yourself. There's not a day that you're not busy with 20 things. 
Our sister Equa just uh, were the SHA, Manchester, and, and now running for uh, uh, the National Women's Committee. The issues in those campaigns become part of the work of Labour Black Socialists. The campaigns in which you're involved become part and parcel. And when people, when should you people win, and it will be a blessing if you win, should you people win, the everyday struggles of people we can trust will be in the chambers and the committee rooms where you find yourself. So we're busy with people in Hartlepool because there are some problems with that candidate who was on a short list for 24 hours, a, a long list of one. There are, there are even the, 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 the situation in Liverpool has gone from bad to catastrophic. It looks like the government might want to take over Liverpool because Labour cannot appear to even organize whatever in a pub. Then, of course, the police and crime <coughs> and courts bill was a big issue this week, and Labour Black Socialists was incredibly busy. Our, our sister Ekua and Maurice, they were there arguing the good, the good cause. Then we had um, our, our sister Ifra came in and organized another channel, um, things that I never knew uh, uh, even existed. And we've, we're on YouTube arguing against this. The and we have been part of that campaign and we added our voice and it looks like the bull is in trouble, not sufficient trouble because the Tories have the numbers to push any bull through that they want, but they cannot have the drama before the local elections. So we managed to kick it into the long grass. The disappointing thing is the Labour front bench on the Friday, they were going to abstain. By the Sunday, they saw mm, there is something to do here. By Monday morning, they were, they were opposing. And if only they had built a coalition against the bull. Again, the Tories have the numbers. They can win anything. And there is, the reason why they have the numbers is because of these coup plotters in the Labour Party who are still being re reinstated. The Labour Party could have built a bigger opposition in principle because there are so many things wrong with this bull. It is a bad bull. But we are busy there. We are also busy with the um, BAME structure that has been set up in the NEC um, <clears throat> without input from CLP uh, BAME representatives. People don't know how this structure was conceived, how it is going to function. Those who are lucky receive an email in love from the BAME NEC representative and they say, oh God, oh God. The thing is, that is the BAME NEC representative. We have to work with her, but it is incredibly hard to work with her because she does appear to be working with people other than black people in the, in, in the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. And she takes decisions that you just say, how, how does one reach that kind of decision making? For the, the BAME structure is grounded and legitimized by the democracy review of 2018 of the Labour Party, which wanted to increase the voice and agency of black people. So don't discuss it with, let me mind my language, discuss it with black people. That is how one, that is what the democracy review. So we are busy there. We are making a noise about that. We also raised in our meeting, uh, Labour Black Socialist meeting, we had a few motions that were passed. We are, we are with the oppressed wherever they are. We, we, we are grounded in the, in the lived experience of black people, but we want justice for everyone. And in this case, we are, our motion on the farmer strike was formally passed. Our motion on the change in the legal status of Kashmir was formally passed. Our motion on the BAME structure was also passed. 
that, and we appeal to the trade unions. Please, I opened, I deliberately opened about how wonderful trade unions are because I come from South Africa without trade unions. Our struggles in South Africa against apartheid would have been impossible. So I opened with a question that you had asked about the, 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 what do trade unions do for us? I remember the PCS uh, 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 um, website, quick to find it, and I spoke about that. Now that I've spoken well about the trade unions, I've earned the right to be critical because <laughs> the issue is they are wonderful when they do good work, but in this case, they cut off our legs. Yeah. The membership, the black membership in the Labour Party made one decision, and it is unclear how the trade unions just made a decision. Again, the representative is <sighs> who the representative is. At this stage, we have to work with it because we have to make the bank structure work anyway. So we are there. We just wanted the trade unions. Next time when this decision comes around, please give the black sections the authority to run that election. Mm -hmm. So, and then of course, I want to, I want to talk about just in mention in passing the, 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 the heroes of the homeless campaign, the vaccination campaign, um, People like Sunny Morali, Bridget, uh, Dr. Zahi Chohan, and my sister with a name which I am incapable of saying. It's H A U T Tam. Hi, you. Hi, you. Yes, hi, you, Tam. Yeah. These are people who are working with you who every day they wake up. And you can see them putting wind in the sails of homeless people. Water under the boats of homeless people and asylum seekers. Seeking for them to be vaccinated. Seeking for them to be loved. And I thought it would be amiss to say, I haven't mentioned all the names, but these are the ones that I can quickly and then of course there is Christine PhD student and Ruth our dear our, our dearest friend people who they've got no, nothing to gain mm -hmm. and they are busy with these campaigns every day and we are there in the mix and you are the one who keeps the show on the road we are building solidarity with other structures um, who are wanting to ensure that the Labour Party is held to account, and we run the move on these on these issues. Um, just a, a few moments ago, we expressed solidarity with with uh, Professor David Miller at Bristol. So things are happening. The other thing, last thing that I want to mention on the on the um, police and crime bill, I've noticed one of the pro, one of the front benches of the Labour Party actually sent out a tweet mm. in support mm. of the violence against mm. the protesters. Now, I don't believe in the use of violence in, in protesting. But I can say the police have a particular competence in raising the level of anxiety in a protest, making violence almost inevitable. Mm. They must just do their job, ensure that people's right to protest is protected. There will be some inconvenience, but that is what protest is about. But I am concerned that a Labour Party front venture tweets praising the violence of the police. That's also the Labour Party member who had a year ago said some rather horrible things about gypsy, Roma and traveller people. Another cause in which we are involved. 
We, we, we're involved everywhere, but everywhere we see, it is not always the Tories that, that happen to be our first obstacle. It is unbelievable. We are talking about a Labour Party that used to routinely in the 1980s support the anti-apartheid struggle. You had councils who passed resolutions and formally decided not to have anything to do with apartheid South Africa. I'm talking about labor controlled councils who said that the life and honor and dignity of black people in South Africa is non-negotiable. They're not going to allow the facilities, the offices, the venues of the council. You're talking about 120 labor controlled councils taking decisions by about 1985 that they are going to support and defend the boycott of apartheid South Africa. Hmm. Today, it is almost controversial to talk for the interests and the dignity of black people in labor controlled councils. They, they take policies on housing, on education, take exclusions. The majority of people disproportionately excluded from education are black people in labor controlled councils. And that is why we exist. Oh, we're on the move. Mm. We are busy. And we've got people like you and our sister there. Once you're in the council, we know that you will be a champion of the least in society. You're not there because you want a career. You are there because there is pain in the communities from which you come. And only you can tell about that pain. And you are there to speak the truth. And Marcuse says, the precondition for truth is to let suffering speak. If the suffering is not spoke, speaking and heard, there is no truth. And that is why people need to vote for the two of you and all these other people that Labour Black Socialists are backing. Yes, we are campaigning. Anyone who says, oh, Labour Black Socialists are, are saying don't campaign. No, we are going to campaign for you and Sister Ekua and every Black Socialist and every Socialist that we can trust. All these right-wing people, we're not going to vote against a campaign against you. That is a waste of our time. We are standing for something and we are standing to get more black people, more socialists, more left-wing people into the councils because I believe there was once a time when I was oppressed in South Africa and it is councillors who ensured that by 1988, Margaret Thatcher passed a law that, that said councils, it is inappropriate business for councils to talk about political issues. See where the inappropriate business from the Labour Party headquarters comes from? Mm -hmm. Come from Margaret Thatcher. But we need people like you, and that is what we're campaigning for, People like you, Sister Equa, our brother Maurice and others. We're not against anyone. We're just for justice for people, ordinary people who are not being heard. But we love you. You are the people who are going to go there. And at the cost of yourselves, you are going to advocate for the poorest of the poor. And only when the conditions of the poorest of the poor are addressed will there be justice for all. So we're on the move. It's been a busy week. And we can expect that the week that lies ahead will be even busier. So anyone who has stacks of money, if you want to speak to these two people here in this program, they will, want, they will know what to do with your money. We need full-time people to deal with these things because there are some full-time people in political office who are not doing these things. That's why we need you in office, but we also need an office to back you. I think that's enough.
Thank you, Ridwan. That was a great update. And um, thank you, everyone else, for joining us this week. Join us next week, where an MP will be joining us. I won't reveal. You will just have to this week.